church counselor, Sinbad. But you know, ain't nothing like experience, is it? There's nothing like experience. Tuesday night, 7.30, come, we all messed up, right? We, we, just be here. Uh, and we want to talk about marriage. But today, we want to look in the book of Acts, first chapter, verse 6 through verse 9, and many of us are so familiar with the, the book of Acts. It's the historical book of the New Testament. Verse 6 through verse 9, the NIV reads this. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, you've got to understand that the Jewish mindset was that Messiah would come to liberate them. A physical liberation. They were under the thumb of Rome. And they had been uh, in captivity under various nations throughout their history. And there was always the promise that the ultimate deliverance would come one day through Messiah. And so they had bought into Jesus' ministry. They had bought into his um, vision. And so here it was now. He had been crucified, and, and, and they're wondering now, you've come back. What is there left to do? And so they gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This was not a, a spiritual kingdom that they were thinking about at this time. This was a, a, a literal kingdom. But here's Jesus' response. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then he uses that conjunction there. He says, but. So don't worry about that. Because there is a greater task. There's something else that God has in store for you. There's another work that God has laid out for you. He says, don't you worry about when God is going to restore the kingdom because the times are not for you to know. But instead, it's better read. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Not my conquerors, but my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up from before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. I want to spend some time this morning speaking on the subject to the ends of the earth. The last charge in Acts 1-8 was that the disciples would go to the uttermost or to the farthest parts of the earth. There was to be no boundary over which the gospel would not cross. There is a challenge today and a shift in the missionary zeal and the missionary focus. Though the gospel began in the Middle East, it began in Jerusalem, and it spread to the uttermost parts of the earth. In our generation, the 1800s, the 1900s, and now in the 20s, we, we who are in the West became the senders. Ironically, we were not the first. If you go back to the book of Acts, we remember that the Ethiopian eunuch came from Ethiopia Philip the evangelist led him to the Lord. He took the gospel back to Ethiopia. And we know that there are some that believe that the literal Ark of the Covenant is somewhere in Ethiopia. But the gospel came out of that place to this place, and then now we in this era came to believe that the gospel originated with us somehow. But as time marches on, tables have turned. The places to which the West once sent missionaries are now sending missionaries to the West. America is as much a sending force as it is a receiving field. 
slowly and incrementally we're becoming more and more secular as the day goes by. But when I think of missions, my mind goes back to my childhood. Being from an island nation, we were always surrounded by missionaries. Every denomination sent missionaries. And as a little boy, my, my, my mother attended a Bible class led by a missionary lady by, by the name of Sister Sarag. She was about three foot two. She had a German accent. But when you saw her, you thought you were seeing Mother Teresa. But she would hold these Bible studies. And I remember my mom taking me along, and I would sit on the side as my mom and these other ladies participated with the missionary in the Bible studies. My very first real Bible with the concordance and everything in the back and the pictures was given to me by that missionary lady. The church I grew up in was, and has always been, a missionary-focused church. Way back as a child, I can remember the missionary budget being in the hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, supporting missionaries all around the world. And so through sermons and books, I would read books about, about missionaries through movies and personal encounters during our missionary conferences, I was exposed to the biblical mandate to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. In fact, it was in a missions conference. I was 14 years old, and a preacher from Canada was our, uh, our missionary preacher for the week. And I can remember on that Wednesday evening, the middle week of the conference, back in those days, we'd have a full week of missions conference, and the missionaries would come from the field, and they would come from all over. They'd come from India and Africa and, and South America, and they would all come, and they'd be in our church for a week. They'd teach Sunday school, and they'd have sessions during the daytime, and they'd have, you know, back then, slides were, were you know, it, was, it was new cutting-edge technology. And they'd come with their little uh, 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 slide projectors, and they'd have pictures of, of the work that they were doing on the field. And as kids, we would be fascinated by the work that they were doing. And back then, these missionaries were missionaries who were giving their lives to the mission field. And it was that Wednesday night, as the preacher preached, that I felt the call of God to ministry. And so missions and mission conferences have a special place in my heart because it's sometimes in those focused moments that God is able to capture the attention of his children. From the earliest days of Christianity, there was missionary zeal, evangelistic zeal to carry the message of salvation to every corner of the earth. But the message has not reached everyone. There are still those that need to hear the gospel. There is still a Jerusalem. There's still a Judea. There's still a Samaria. And there's obviously the uttermost part of the earth. And it's possible for those of us in America to become lulled to sleep to believe that we are the center of Christianity. But if we would read and we would look, Africa is exploding today. There are more converts in Africa than anywhere else on the planet today. Some of us are unaware because the media who informs us doesn't tell us. But our Christian brothers and sisters in Africa are being slaughtered by the hundreds weekly for naming the name of Christ. There are still billions of people who do not know Christ as Savior. Millions right here in America. Thousands right in our neighborhoods that don't know Jesus Christ. 
The sad part is that it's estimated that 95% of all Christians today will never lead someone to Jesus. And over the next few weeks, God has given me a task, and that's the task to make you uncomfortable. Someone has said that the church is designed, or the preaching is designed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. You see, every Christian is commissioned, for every Christian is a missionary. Dr. Vance Havner says that it has been said that the gospel is not merely something to come to church to hear, but something to go from church to tell. It's also been said that Christianity began as a company of lay witnesses. It's become a professional pulpitism financed by lay spectators. And while there is a special ministry for pastors and teachers and evangelists, it is for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Churches once again need to capture a great passion to fulfill the Great Commission. To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To make disciples of all nations. To be a house of prayer for all nations. It's not just a good idea. It's a God ideal. It's been said that the mark of a great church is not seating, its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. Let me say that again. The mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. Who are we sending to the field? Who are we sending to the field? Someone asked me uh, 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 several years ago, they said, Pastor, how is it that, that, very, that none, in fact, said, I've seen none of our young people have, have been called to ministry. We hand out scholarships year after year, $20, $25,000 a pop, and none of it goes to anyone that's wanting to go into ministry. We can't make people go into ministry. They've got to feel the call of God to go into ministry. But the question does stop you in your tracks. And as a pastor, it says, it says to me, are there no one whom God is speaking to? Or are we not making room for those whom God is speaking to? how to reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So our charge today is to lift up Jesus. Not just in our songs, not just in our praises, not just in our singing, because let's be real, when we're in here singing and praising, very few people see us. It's a holy huddle where we encourage each other, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the mandate. So I want to look for just a few moments this morning at three ways to get the message to the world. Three words to take this message to the harvest. For the word of Christ is still real as it ever was. He says what? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know, nowadays, we, 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 we're so afraid. We were all set to go into Haiti two years ago, and the word came down that there's unrest in Haiti, and so no one's going in, and we, and we didn't go. About five or six years ago, I, we were ready to go into Nigeria, and the State Department set out, a travel warning to U.S. citizens to be careful and, and not go to Nigeria because they were kidnapping Americans. And I said to my wife, you know what, baby, I don't want to be responsible for anybody being kidnapped in Nigeria, so I think we're going to cancel the trip. And I did cancel the trip, but when we think of the environment in which these first disciples followed Jesus they were not free from persecution. 
But how many of us want to die for Christ? Oh, I want to live for Jesus. But do we want to die for Christ? Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But our Christianity has been so watered down that we believe that all that Jesus came for is to give us a big house and a bank account. That Jesus came for my Mercedes. That Jesus came for my place out in, in, in South Hillsborough County. That God came for the best Armani suits. And God came that I would look nice and feel. See, we, we, we've taken Christianity and we've said there's no longer any part of Christianity that calls for suffering. It is all about what will make me feel better. And so the first thing I believe as we enter this missions month is we need to think about going to the harvest. How do we go to the harvest? Isaiah 6, 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. I mentioned that, that, that night long ago in that missions conference. This is the verse that Jim Blackwood preached on that night. This is the verse that captured my heart. This is the verse that God used to call me into ministry. As I sat in that service that night and Jim Blackwood began to preach on this word, whom shall I send? It was as if God himself was speaking to me as if he isolated me in that congregation and I was the only one sitting there. And as if God said to me, whom shall I send? And I said to him, here am I, send me. I was 14 years old. I was on my way to becoming an engineer. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to become an electrical engineer. That, that's what I, that was my dream. And in that moment, God captured my heart. When I graduated high school, I actually went to college for a semester to do electrical engineering. And near the end of that first semester, I was like, this is not what I want. And I left, I went to Bible school, hearing the call, hearing the call. And, and it doesn't mean that, that if God calls you, you, you necessarily have to leave your profession because God calls us to, to many ways to spread the gospel. But, but I tell you, in that moment, I knew that God was speaking to me for a different direction. And I remember my uncle saying to me, son, make sure you got to fall back. And, you know, he just was looking out for me because he said to me, there's not one preacher I know that don't have a second job. <laughs> and back then, that was, the, that was the way it was. And so he, he wasn't discouraging me. He just wanted me to be prepared. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? First Baptist Church of College Hill, according to history, is actually an MB church, Missionary Baptist. The story is told of a missionary in China back in the 19th century whose talents and abilities were so outstanding that one of the American companies tried to hire him. They offered him an attractive job with a salary to match, but he turned it down. He told them that God had sent him to China as a missionary. He thought that that would end the matter, but instead they came back with a better offer and an increase in salary. He turned that down too. But again, they came back doubling the financial package. Finally, he said to them, it's not your salary that's too small. It's the job that's too small. When God calls us, he bids us come and die. And so we go to the call, and we hear the call, we acknowledge the call, and then we go to the call. God may be calling someone here today to go into long-term Christian missionary work to get up out of their comfort zone, to leave America. Maybe, maybe even if it's not America, to leave Tampa, to go somewhere else. Maybe not leave Tampa, but leave your job. 
to do something for him. Maybe God is calling you to short-term mission work. First Baptist, that's what we've been engaged in a whole lot of short-term mission work, and that's been such a, 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 an emphasis. And I, and I just want to say this. It, it has been an awesome growth and stretching experience for our church. Many of you, when, when we announce short-term mission trips, you say, ah, that's somebody else. But I can say to you today that I have seen men and women in this church take on a whole new vision and view of God because of their short-term mission experience. Last year, we went to Mississippi to help Dr. Holloway at Mendenhall Ministries. A group of us went, almost 20 of us, went to Mississippi. And we spent a week, and by the time we left the week, there was work undone. We came with a plan, and we didn't get it done because, you know, the unexpected always arises, and so we spent most of the week on a project that we thought would take a couple of days, but it took pretty much the week. And on the way back, one of the brothers said to me, he says, we can't leave this like this. By the time we got back to Tampa, they had gathered in their little huddle, and they came to me, and they said, Pastor, we're we going back. We got to go back. It wasn't pastor initiated. But the brothers had, had seen with their own eyes how they could be a benefit to the kingdom of God and to the people of God, and God birthed in them this desire. And a month later, they paid their own way, got in a vehicle, and drove all the way back to Mississippi to finish the work. They're about to leave again the 31st of May to go back to Mississippi to give themselves to the field again. What am I saying to you? Is that you don't have to go long term. You can go short term and make a difference in the lives of someone somewhere. But how about embracing the mission in our midst? Do you realize that people are migrating to America every single week? Don't mind what they're saying in the news. That's just people arriving. People are coming. The nations are coming. I was so challenged this, this last week. I knew about it before, but, but, but it was reemphasized that there's a church in our community in, in, right here in Temple Terrace that has more Muslims on their campus every week during the week than Christians. They have a class that teaches English as a second language. So all of these refugees that need to learn English come to that church, and they've been given opportunity to share Jesus. God is sending the field to us. We had opportunity some years ago to relocate and help relocate um, refugees from Africa. We had a house that we had set aside that we would put those, those refugees in as they came through and, and, and get them acclimatized to America. What was that? God was sending the world So there's ways that we can do this. We can, we, we can go long-term. We can go short-term. We can embrace the mission in our midst. But the second thing that we need to focus on is sending to the harvest. We can go to the harvest. You can go yourself, and that may be the challenge that God is, is, is working in you right now. But if you can't go, you can send. If you can't go, you can send. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And here's, here's the key. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The church ought to always be in a position to send. 
Ascending doesn't always mean that there's, that there's, there's full salary to go. It just means that we commission you to go. We send you off to go. And this is one of the things that we ought to be encouraging, but we ought to also be sending. They sent them off. And that's why when missionaries are leaving to go, we make it a point to call them forward and lay hands on them and pray over them and send them to the field. It's the church's obligation. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus told the disciples to go, and they went. And so it's the church's obligation, but it's also the church's preparation. And a part of Mission Month is to expose our people to missions and to missionaries to expose you to the need, to expose you to the field, to allow you to see that the gospel is still working in the hearts and the lives of people. And then there's the church's delegation. I want to encourage you to give yourself to mission work. Our children are not being given a vision of God's call. If you look around our city from time to time, you'll see those two guys riding their bicycle. And in that certain sect, they give two years of missionary work before they even go off to college. And they're devoted to spreading their faith. We've got to do something different. Do you know there's a saying, and I, I, I've shared this, and we shared it all the time, is, is that we, we bemoan the results. But our system of doing church is perfectly designed for the results we're getting. If we're not winning people to Christ, it's because we're not practicing soul winning. If our children are not having a call and a heart, not all, but if, if there's not an excitement for Christ, there's something wrong in the process. I shared this uh, the other day, and, 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 and it was the first time I think I did it publicly, and, and, and a lot of the people recognized what I was saying. How many of you have ever owned a Ford Explorer? If you've owned a Ford Explorer, put your hand up. Let me say a couple of you have owned a Ford Explorer. If you've owned a Ford Explorer, I'm almost certain that the tailgate of your car cracked. There was a crack in the tailgate. I see people nodding their heads. Somewhere along the line, a certain generation of Ford Explorers had a defect. And after a while, all of them ended up with a crack. And I just noticed it. I would just be driving. And one day, I just, it just hit me. How is it that every Ford Explorer has a crack in its tailgate? Do you know what? Ford had a system that was perfectly designed to create cracks in the tailgate. I don't think it wasn't designed for that. They didn't want that to happen, but there was a defect in the production system, whether it was how it was assembled, whether it was the material that they used, whether it, it, it was the way the car was designed, that it, it caused tension, it caused the crack to happen, but it happened almost in the same place on all of the Ford Explorers. So what am I saying? When we see things happen in our lives and in our churches, we have to go back and ask, why? If our church doesn't have a heart for the harvest, why? If we're not consumed with the gospel getting out there, why? 